let's start. Good afternoon, everyone. Before Chair Sherry Wu calls this in-person and online competition to order, here are some housekeeping announcements. For those of you here at Jefferson Community Center, the microphones will be off throughout the meeting and are very sensitive. Please do not mute them and please do not speak while someone else has the floor. Otherwise, remote participants will not be able to hear what is being said. When speaking, please identify yourself first before you um, begin talking. Online committee members and staff, please unmute your microphones and turn on your cameras when it is your turn to speak. For community members participating in the public comment periods, please step up to the podium uh, so the microphone can pick up your voice. And online participants, click the raise hand button in the webinar controls. Phone participants, press star nine to raise your And the chair or staff will prompt you when it is your turn to speak. We are accepting email public comments for this, uh, for this meeting, uh, during the meeting at public comment at redwoodenergy.org. Online participants, if you experience phone or internet disruptions during this meeting, notify as you can by either calling or texting 707-572-7182 or by emailing public comment at redwoodenergy.org. That's all for housekeeping announcements. Thank you, Laurie. Welcome everybody. This is the RCEA. Board of Directors meeting for March 23rd, 2023. We're at the Jefferson Community Center. And it's kind of exciting for me that we're in person. We haven't been in person for quite a while. So this is really great. Welcome everybody. Um, next, I guess we need a roll call. And um, so we're going to, you're going to call everybody out. Is that right, Larry? Okay, let's do it. Uh, Director Bauer. Here. Director Arroyo. Here. Director Jorgensen. Here. Director Mobley. Here. Director Sherry Provost. Here. Director Elise Stefani is absent. Vice Chair Sarah Schaefer. Here. Director Jack Tuttle. Here. Director Frank Wilson. Here. And Director uh, Chair Wu. Here. There is a quorum. Yay. Okay, so next up we have. Um, oh. Um, to announce that uh, Supervisor Arroyo, Director Arroyo, is participating remotely um, for just cause. Uh, she was traveling for county business. That's it. Thank you. Sure. And so with that, I think we do not have to do item 1.1, correct? Yes. Okay, so we can move off of that one and move straight into reports from member entities. So this is the time for those of us on the board to um, report out anything that you would like to at this time. I'm sorry. No, um, I, <laughs> I attended the um, CAC meeting a couple of weeks ago, which I th thought was very interesting. Um, it gave me more of an insight to what's happening here, and they had a lot of uh, good ideas that they're putting forward. So I'll um, come up with more of a presentation on that for our next meeting. Thank you, Chris. I'll say um, I had the opportunity to attend a conference, um, the Civic Well Conference in Asilomar with some of uh, my council colleagues and also Director Arroyo as well. Um, and I got to learn a little bit about our CEA's beginnings uh, as from the previous iteration of that same organization, which was the Local Government Commission, which was interesting to learn, uh, but also just to be in a space with a lot of like-minded um, policymakers and a lot of folks that a lot about CCAs and, you know, what our CEA is all about and what, you know, a lot of folks in our community are trying to do. Um, so if anybody wants to hear more, I won't ramble on about it forever, but um, it was a great experience. Civic Well is a really cool organization that I recommend checking out. Um, if any of this stuff about energy or policy around climate change um, interests, interests any of you or any of your um, colleagues on your councils as well. So, Thanks, Sarah. Anybody else? I'll go. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yeah, go ahead, Natalie. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I also went to the Civic Well Conference, so um, I got a lot out of it. One of the um, best parts was um, talking uh, in more depth with uh, California Energy Commission Vice Chair Sivagunda, who's come up to Humboldt a couple times. He's also going to be 
um, coming up to Humboldt um, and Del Norte County in the in the summer months sometime, um, which is really exciting to be helping with local um, energy resilience work in our region and um, just really got a lot out of that small group opportunity to talk with um, folks from the California Energy Commission, California Transportation Commission, um, some of the public utilities uh, like the Sacramento Municipal Utilities District. So definitely a lot of um, learning around energy to be done. Um, and then as our chair um, so kindly pointed out, um, or staff, I should say, um, I am at our strategic planning for the county in Binbo, and I just wanted to note that um, we do not have a Zoom option, unfortunately, but um, it is open to the public, um, and the Binbo KOA is the facility that's hosting us tomorrow for an all-day strategic planning, um, day three of strategic planning, so um, if anyone is down here, I'd welcome their attendance. Um, we did have some public participation today, but um, I'm sure that there will be elements of energy and resiliency woven through that conversation as well. Um, I think that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Is there anybody? Yeah, go ahead, Sherry. Thank you. I just wanted to say, uh, thank you for having the Iraq tribe join the board. We're excited to be here. And uh, when Vice Chair Myers is not available, you will see my face here at the table. So thank you. Welcome. Anybody else? Or... Okay. So I'm going to move on to oral communications. This is a time provided for people to address the board or submit written communication on matters not on the agenda. And at the conclusion of these oral communications, the board may respond to statements, but any request that requires board action be set by the board for a future agenda or referred to staff. And um, we do have public comment. It's um, hard copy is at our um, tables here. And these are also um, posted online on our website, right? Yes. All right. So is there anybody from the public at this time? Hi. Yes, I believe Julie Neander here. Hang on just a minute. Um, go ahead. Okay, Can go ahead, Julie. Me? Yeah, okay. thank you, Julie. Great, thank you for having me. Um, Julie Neander, I am retired now, but I used to work for the city of Arcata and I worked on a lot of energy issues when I worked with the city. Um, I'm here about RCEA's banking and it has to do with um, just certain banks have investments in expanding fossil fuels. And so I have a letter to read and then just a few things I'd like to add afterwards if there's time. So the letter is dated uh, March 20th and it, it reads, Dear Matthew Marshall and the RCEA Board of Directors, as CCA members of RCEA, we are writing concerning RCEA's banking at Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, like all banks, credit unions, plays an essential role in our society and facilitates much good. Unfortunately, Wells Fargo is a significant funder of fossil fuel expansion projects. We are requesting RCEA inform Wells Fargo that RCEA and its customers are concerned enough about their funding of the fossil fuel industry that RCEA will consider looking for another bank if Wells Fargo does not stop. Wells Fargo has provided $272 billion in lending and underwriting the fossil fuel industry between 2016 and 2021, third among global banks. Wells Fargo's top fossil fuel clients from 2016 to 21 were fracking giants Pioneer Natural Resources, 21 billion, Diamondback Energy, 14 billion, and Marathon Petroleum, 7.2 billion. Pipeline project funding included Tallgrass Energy, 6.1 billion, and Enbridge, 5.9 billion. By funding these projects, Wells Fargo is funding climate destruction. RCA has been and is a leader on the North Coast promoting climate-friendly energy procurement and production as well as energy efficiency programs. For the above reasons and more, RCEA should ask any banking service RCEA uses to stop funding fossil fuel expansion and support transitioning to sustainable, low-carbon, net-zero emissions energy. Please contact local Wells Fargo staff and Wells Fargo's Chief Executive Officer, Charles W. Scharf, as soon as possible with RCEA's concerns. Wells Fargo Corporate Office is located at 420 Montgomery Street, San Francisco, California, 94104. 
If Wells Fargo does not change its practices, we urge RCEA to switch to a bank and or credit union that meets RCEA's banking needs and also invests in projects that promote decarbonization of our energy sources. Thank you very much. And then there's a number of signatories, which um, I think you have all of that in front of you. So rather than taking up the time to read it, I'd just like to say a few other things. Um, one being that I know you can't act on this now because it's gotta be placed on a future agenda. However, the shareholders meetings for Wells Fargo and many other banks are happening in April. So I would urge the board to consider another meeting um, so that you actually could consider this um, item and make a decision and then direct your staff, if you agree, to send a letter to Wells Fargo. And I think I also really wanna to stress to you that we're not asking that you stop banking with Wells Fargo at this point. We're just asking you let them know your concerns and if they don't change their policies, then consider that. Um, I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have and or assist your staff in gathering more information should you decide to direct that they write a letter. Thanks so much. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Julie. Um, I forgot to say at the beginning that um, we would like to have our public comments uh, timing uh, limited to three minutes. And Julie, I think you got it right in under the wire there. Thank you. Um, and so um, I think what I'm going to do right now is we'll go ahead and finish out the other public comment and then we can come back to staff and um, I think we'll probably have questions up here um, at the board level as well. Is there anybody else from the public who'd like to um, address the board? <laughs> All right, I'm not hearing any so. Um, I'll bring it back up to the board. Is there any um, comments um, about the um, Wells Fargo and what Julie has brought to us? I am interested in perhaps seeing a letter that could be drafted because I think divesting from fossil fuels is important. I agree. Okay. At this point, we can, can we give direction to the board? Because it wasn't on the agenda? No. Say we want it to be agendized. Yeah. To see. Okay. All right. Um, I guess I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to talk about banking and just my general executive director update because there's other banking news going on. And okay. I'll give an update. All right. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Is there anybody from the, um, anybody else from the board? So just to clarify on that topic, um, that would be an appropriate time to then talk about um, banking in a broader sense, right? Since that's already part of your direct your update. Yeah. So 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 we have we have some funds of uh, First Republic, and so I'll just that's the teaser, and I'm going to bring up you know kind of the status of that. Okay. So that will be under item eight point one. Eh? Okay. Okay. All right, well, if um, that's it from the public for oral communications, I'm gonna close that. And I'll open up the consent calendar next. All matters on the consent calendar are considered to be routine by the board and are enacted in one motion. There's no separate discussion of any of these items, but if discussions required, we can pull one, of the, one or more of the items from consent and consider them separately. Um, at the end of the reading of this consent calendar, the board members or members of the public can request that an item is removed for separate discussion. So the items are 3.1, approved minutes of the February 23rd meeting and the March 9th meeting. 3.2 is approved the disbursements report. 3.3 is accept financial reports. 3.4 is to reappoint Norman Bell, Catherine Gurren, Christopher Honar, Richard Johnson, Luna Latimer, and Kit Mann to the, CA, to the Community Advisory Committee for two-year terms ending March 31st, 2025. And item 3.1 is accept the RCEA Supplier Diversity 2022 Annual Report and Plan. And um, I'll kick it off because I want to pull 3.4. Is there anybody else from the board who'd like to pull an item? Nope. Is there anybody from the public who'd like to pull an item? Well, I'm not seeing any, so um, need a motion to accept 
three one, three two, three three, and three five. So moved. So moved. Second. <laughs> First and second. <clears throat> Roll call vote. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Was that Schaefer and, and Bauer? So um, all those in favor, please raise your hand. So that is Mobley, Schaefer, Wu, Bauer, Wilson, uh, not a couple of uh, <laughs> Jorgensen and okay. Tuttle and uh, Director Arroyo. Aye or no? Yes, aye. Aye. And uh, Director Scafani is absent. May I ask for no's to raise your hand? And abstain to raise hand. Thank you. Provo, uh, abstain. Thank you. This motion passes. All right. Um, I pulled 3.4 because I just wanted to thank those um, people who we're hopefully reappointing if we go ahead and, and vote yes on this. Um, the CAC has been a really, uh, it, it's been a really great group for the board. We've gotten a lot of, I mean, basically they, they do a lot of work. Some of it, um, you know, is with staff. Uh, and it's it's not just, you know, opinion or, you know, what are your different values work, which is super valuable. We do a lot of technical work as well. And I just wanted to throw that out there. So to thank these these members and the CAC in general. Anything else from anybody up here? Go ahead, Matthew. I, I was I was going to pull this item for a different reason. Um, and I just wanted to bring up that. Um, as, as I think everybody knows, there's a number of appointments that are by jurisdiction and they have at large positions. Um, now that the Yurok tribe has joined, we need to like change that. And so um, we, we didn't do that you know, with this, this round, but the thought was to convert one of the at large positions to a Yurok tribe appointment. And if, you know, the thought was to do that when that term was up so that we were you know, removing somebody midterm, but to, to basically when those at large positions come up to uh, you know, have one of them convert to a, a Yurok tribe appointment and then have the other at large positions go forward as just a collective board um, review of the at large candidates. Okay. Do we know when that would be, Matthew? March 31st, 2020. Yeah, so it would. I don't know if you heard that. Was no, I couldn't hear that. So 2024 is when the outlier. Gotcha. And so it would be keeping the current committee. So these folks were, were jurisdictional appointments, but the outlier folks will be up. Okay. Um, so we could do it before then if you'd like us to bring it back, but otherwise we'd bring it back in March. Uh, yeah. Anybody else from the board have any comments, questions on this? Uh, anybody from the public? We're at item 3.4. I'm, I'm sort of quasi public because I'm on the prison. Uh, I I really appreciate your comments, and I think everyone on the committee appreciates um, because they're very enthusiastic and they're very engaged, and I think they want to bring the best that they can forward. So I'll carry that message back to them. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry, who are you? I'm Dennis Leonardi. I'll, uh, okay. So that way, um, on the floor, you need that. Okay. A member of the public online. All right. Um, then I need a motion for 3.4. I'll move for approval of the CAC appointments. Second. Okay. Motion by Jorgensen, second by Schaefer. Yep. Uh, so all those in favor, please raise your hand. That is Mobley, Schaefer, Wu Bauer, Wilson, Kobo, Jorgensen, Huddle, and Arroyo. Absent is uh, Stefani, motion pass. Thank you, Lori. Next up, we have old business. And um, um, is this, is this um, CCA business or just no, just any old business? Any old business. Any old business. Okay. No CCA business today. Okay. So, yes, we have a quorum. Um, so how about 6.1 update from California Fishermen's Resiliency Association? I'll just provide a, a quick update that was in the, the, the written staff report that um, as we're working on offshore wind, you know, very early on, we um, identified that we needed to work with um, commercial fishermen who use that part of the ocean and um, had an MOU with the Humboldt Fishermen's Market Association, which is you know, the Eureka Harbor Association. Um, and um, Partway through that relationship, we provided them a mini grant 
to make sure that they weren't, you know, having to dig into fishermen's pockets to engage on these issues because they're get asked to come to a lot of meetings and and do a lot of work. And and one of the things that they did with those funds was create a new organization to bring more of the different harbors together, which is the uh, California Fishermen's Resilience Association. And um, we have just an informational update on you know what what they've been up to and and um, the status of, of fishing in relation to offshore wind. And so. I think we have Ken and Linda Bates uh, here to present, and I think we have some slides teed up for them. You guys are welcome to sit at the table or stand at the podium or whatever is most comfortable to you. Good afternoon. Uh, okay. You know what? I'm going to get somebody else to run this. Yep. That's cool. <laughs> I'll destroy it. It's done. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Ken Bates. Um, I'm here representing the uh, California Fishermen's Resiliency Association. And um, before I actually dive into some of the stuff, I'd like to take a couple seconds and talk about um, my personal relationship to energy use. And I know this sounds a little strange, but things that you see at people get up and they're, they're opposed to stuff. It's the not in my backyard thing. I'm a third generation commercial fisherman. I was born in San Pedro um, in 1949, it's a while ago. I've been in Humboldt County since 1970, and I've been fishing out of the Puerto Eureka since 1974. In early spring, my wife and I pack up our boat, usually by mid-April, and we get on the boat and we take off to go to work. We operate the boat um, between, basically from, essentially from Fort Bragg, clear down as far south as Monterey County, that kind of a thing. The boat's small, it's 32 feet. We've taken it clear up to Alaska and it's far south as, as uh, San Diego. Um, the boat, the cabin on the boat's eight foot by nine. It's got two bunks, the engine's contained in the cabin, there's a diesel stove and a sink. That's our home for basically uh, for four to five months. Um, we get along really well, otherwise, I would probably be swimming home. <laughs> Typically what we make is four day fishing trips. So we'll gear up, we'll get good ice, fuel, groceries, take off four days. And at the end of the, by the end of the fourth day, we're headed in somewhere to unload. Um, 15 years ago, we decided to go up to Southeast Alaska to work. And there was some opportunity up there. We, before we left, we started looking at our fuel budget in the boat and we kind of had to reassess what we do operating the boat which usually typically run around at 15 or 16 knots. Boats are wildly inefficient. And so when we went up to Alaska, we decided to slow down. What we did is we slowed down to seven knots and we cut our fuel bill down. We cut two thirds off of the fuel use by slowing down. Um, we burned, basically what we did is we burned time instead of fuel. Um, I live within the city limits. Our house is out on Indian Island. I've been off the grid since 1974. Two solar panels and a wind turbine, of all things, for our electricity. Uh, at last count, we had about eight light bulbs in our house. Uh, we have a small TV set. Um, we've got an AM, FM radio, and a vacuum cleaner, which I'm li licensed to operate. Um, Ten years ago, we ended up buying our first car. I've been driving trucks my entire life, and my wife found a car that got 40 miles to the gallon. We pretty much parked our Ford truck that got 10 miles to the gallon. So we've done a bunch of things like, like that to kind of cut down on our fuel use. Um, the, 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 the lifestyle that we live is very easy for us. You know, we, we think we have a pretty low impact on things. We still haven't figured out how to get off propane. We're still using propane for heating. There's a lot of ways all of us as individuals can cut down on what we use and, you know, and it's little pieces at a time and it's cumulative impact. So with that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start to talk about, about what we're doing here locally. So the first thing is that um, fishermen are not opposed to renewable energy. You know, we're very concerned about losing opportunity and uh, that for having fishing ground opportunity and also impacts to harbors. 
if you look at the climate change stuff, fishermen are directly, they're directly uh, impacted by climate change right now. And I'm gonna give you a couple examples that are pretty interesting. So one of the things that we've seen, you know, in the last 10 years is we've seen hot water blobs off of central Oregon, clear up, in, up into Southern Washington. And these are areas of extreme, what would be extreme ocean temperatures that we typically don't see or haven't seen. Um, we've seen uh, low O2 dead zones off of central and southern Oregon. And these are, again, areas where the oxygen levels are quite, quite low in the ocean and cause a lot of mortality to bait fish, to crabs, starfish, all kinds of things like that. Um, recently, in the last two summers, we've seen yellowfin tuna, skipjack, dorado, those kind of things directly in front of Eureka. The range on bluefin tuna has now moved clear up to Shelter Cove. So we are seeing things happening on the ocean. We, we see this stuff going on more and more and more. And fishermen understand that we have to figure out some way to remove ourselves from fossil fuels and much other things. Um, let's see, where are we here? So if we could flip over to the next slide. All right, so you look at this slide, right? Talking about today, actually this slide's a little bit off counter. We're talking about 2000 miles of fishing ground loss in California. That is inaccurate. As it turns out, uh, I set through a four hour CEC workshop on spatial uh, use of the ocean. It looks like it's gonna be closer to 3000 square miles. And the thing that's significant about this is it's not 3000 square miles spread out through the state of California. If you look at California, California is the, if you went offshore, California is, a, the ocean is an absolute, um, there's a grid full of closures and spatial areas and special districts and everything else. And one of the things, as far as the wind power projects are concerned, are national marine sanctuaries. And right now, there is, there is no policy that allows wind farms to be put into a national marine sanctuary. So looking again at California's map, the, the areas that you see for offshore wind right now for Morro Bay, you know, those two areas, they will become surrounded by the Chumash National Marine Sanctuary when that's formed. So that's off. The Department of Defense has so taken a big area from Point Conception around Vandenberg and up to Point Sal, you know, which is south of the Morro Bay Call area, and they've decided that that's also off the map. The San Fran, the, uh, the Cordell Bank and the Monterey uh, National Marine Sanctuaries are also off the map. So what it looks like right now for fishermen, that if we go ahead and we continue to to try to move or you know to put these offshore wind turbine farms in, it looks like everything is going to be north of Point Arena, which is a huge area that we're going to lose for fishing. It's also, the areas are also compromised by the fact that a lot of these areas that are loaded with submarine canyons. You know, there's a canyon off of Redding Rock just below, um, just below uh, Crescent City. But there's the Eel River Canyon, there's the Mendocino Canyon, there's the Matal Canyon, Delgada Canyon, Noyo Canyon. So all of these canyon areas that, that move clear up into the, on the coastal shelf, those are all areas that we can't site any of this equipment. So we're looking at some pretty, some pretty big potential losses for the fishing industry over time. So one of the things that's happened, and we can flip over to the next slide. Let's see. Can we go one more? Ah, oh, cool. So one of the things, we're going to come back to that. So one of the things that's happened is that fishermen now have been at meetings for six years. We have met with BOEM again and again and again. That's Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. But they're the ones that are responsible for going ahead and, and putting together the lease areas. Um, we have met with the Coastal Commission, lots and lots of meetings with the Coastal Commission. The Coastal Commission is significant if you're a fisherman. It's the only state agency that actually has language to prevent, to, to protect uh, harbor and coastal uses for, for the fishing fleet. Um, Department of uh, Fish and Game, we've been meeting with those guys, and California Energy Commission and State Lands. One of the things that keeps coming up at these meetings is that the meeting participants from the agencies keep have kept saying to fishermen, just point at the map, just show us right here where you're fishing, just point at that spot. Fishing is far more complicated that, within that. And so, so one of the things that ended up happening was that there was some there's there's been this repeated request from state agencies to try to figure out where guys are working. You know, fishermen move with a fish. At one point, Humboldt State University had made an offer to go ahead and for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars 
do mapping of fishing grounds off of right off of here off of Humboldt County. And fishermen were not willing to participate with that because basically what they were concerned about was having um, having another agency or academic, uh, you know, academic, um, another like the college basically take their information, you know, that's anecdotal. If I tell you something that's anecdotal and process it and turn it into a commodity that they were going to sell to the state agencies. So what ended up happening is at one of these meetings, the young president of Humboldt Fishermen's Marketing Association, Harrison Ibach, says to this room full of people, we're going to do our own mapping. It was silent in the room, absolutely silent. It was the most unpopular thing you could possibly have said. And what ended up happening is that Humboldt Fishermen's Marketing Association, the, the um, Salmon Trollers Marketing Association of Fort Bragg and Crescent City Association signed an agreement between the three fishermen's associations to do this mapping project. We applied to Ocean Protection Council, you know, and made the argument in a grant application that this would be a worthwhile project in part because most of the data that California Fish and Wildlife have and National Marine Fisheries Service have for fish areas of fish landings and actual catch areas is really, really bad. So the bottom line is, is that it took us almost two and a half years to convince Ocean Protection Council with the help from Jared Huffman's office to go ahead and to kick out some money so we did this grant thing we so we did a mapping project it ended up we thought we could do it for forty five thousand. by the time ocean protection council was done with the actual grant application it was close to 90. the bottom line is is we got it done so that mapping project is the first mapping project done anywhere in continental united states by fishermen's groups you know to basically map species um and and bottom contours, all the things that you know that require that are requirements. So, for instance, I'm going to give you an example. If we gave you one Dungeness crab pot and you had this map, you could drive out there and throw this thing overboard somewhere in these areas that are mapped, and you would catch a crab. Whether you would catch a boatload of crabs is a whole different problem. But these are areas that are that are available to fish. And this this mapping project is now on the wind power data portal for the West Coast. And so it's starting to get used by developers and things like that to look at. Um, now, let's see, where are we here? So if we're gonna drop back to the one that's got, there we go, cool. All right, so this kind of goes into sort of our involvement with this whole wind power process. In 2015, and it's really hard to see, and I couldn't tell you how to fix it. In 2015, the Central Coast Fishermen's Associations were approached by Castle Wind. Castle Wind was interested in putting a wind power project down there. And Matthew's going to correct me if I get the, but I think there were non, a, non, a non solicited request. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So they showed up and they said, we want to do this here. And um, bottom line is what ended up happening is Castle Wind realized that there was going to be significant impacts to fishermen. And a second thing happened is that Castle Wind found out that the Morro Bay, city of Morro Bay, owns the dead power plant that used to belong to Southern California Edison. And it's got, it's got a tunnel that goes out into the ocean, and it may actually have a um, transmission, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of the right word, right away, thank you. So, so the city of Morro Bay has a close relationship with their fishermen down there. The reason that they have a close relationship is that the city of Morro Bay and the fishermen have been working together for 20 years, basically managing money that comes off of submarine cables. Fishermen's Association there has a fund they've set up and the city of Morro Bay has been able to tap into that fund multiple, multiple times over the years. So at that point, Morro Bay, city of Morro Bay goes to Castle Wind and says, okay, you guys were interested in having your project here, but you need to sit down and negotiate with fishermen. So. That sort of started the ball down there. Up here in 2017, Humble Fishermen's Marketing Association was invited by your organization to participate in discussions and to sit through presentations by wind power people, you know, and to work with Matthew and to work with Nancy to try to figure out how we are all gonna figure out how this was gonna work together. 
So we, on top of this, and this is not to butter you up, but we actually owe you a great debt by the fact that you were willing to go ahead and engage with us on that early level. One of the things that happened you know, along the road is that our CEA decided to grant to Humboldt Fisherman's Marketing Association $20,000 to offset our legal costs. Because like anybody that walks into something, if you don't know what you're doing, you find out there's a lot of unintended consequences. And one of the things that we found was that early on when we tried to deal with one of the wind power, potential wind power bidders, we were handed non-disclosure agreements to sign. So the fishermen were going to have to sign the non-disclosure agreement before we could talk. And that's where we got into basically getting legal counsel to help us with those things. Um, in 2022, and another bunch of meetings that were with agency staff, you know, it was the agency staff had continues, this is California agencies, had continued to ask us, you know, we just want one place where we can call. We just want to, we don't have to call 30 guys and find out half of them are in the ocean. How can we just figure out some place to contact you guys? So that was sort of the beginning of the discussion to start the California Fishermen's Resiliency Association. Let's see, where am I on my notes? Could you hit the next slide, please? We'll go, there we go. All right, so there's where we are there. So, so what ended up happening is that um, we collectively, fishermen here, Humble Fishermen's Marketing Association, a few of the guys from Crescent City, a couple guys from Trinidad, went ahead and started looking in to see what it would take to incorporate a new nonprofit. Again, something we know nothing about. And so we ended up doing that and we, we got set up. And at that point, once we actually incorporated this thing in January of 2022, you know, we sent out invitations to participate. And those went to fishermen's associations all up and down the California coast. You know, and so at that point, we started to get members. And when we got members, we went back to Humboldt Fishermen's Marketing Association and said, OK, we have this incorporation formed. You know, we've got a set of bylaws. You know, it's it's got a provision for any place that there's going to be a development, that there's going to be a, man, a regional management committee within the, the scope of the bylaws that allows the regional, the fishermen in that particular area to manage an agreement over the lifespan of the agreement. So we did all those things and we asked Humboldt Fishermen's Marketing Association for financial assistance. And we basically were given $10,000 from the RCEA grant. So part of what I'm going to do today is give you a quick report on where we are with that. So the CFRA took the $10,000 and we used about 3,500 bucks of that to go ahead and get an attorney, a CPA, um, we got federal and state tax exempt status. We set up accounts at the banks, all the kind of things that you do with a new institution sort of flailing around like that. We still have the rest of that balance. We then took the fact that we had this thing set up and we had some money and we went back to Ocean Protection Council. And because we have been offered help from this California Energy Commission about two years before, we were able to go ahead and work with the California Energy Commission, Karen Douglas, who was there at the time was a commissioner. Um, we worked with Kate Hucklebridge at length from the Coastal Con Commission and um, some folks from state lands and fishing game. And we basically applied for an operation grant so that we could run this thing. Uh, Ocean Protection Council was allowed to grant us $99,000 per year. It's in two phases. So we have $99,000 this year, we have $99,000 next year, and then phase two will reapply and we'll, we'll get three more years of funding. And that's set up so that we have outreach, so we have attorney's fees. We've got, now we have a grant manager, you might know her, Lise, um, Lynette Mullen, you know, who is already whipping us into shape, you know, so we've been very fortunate there. Um, we have a bunch of deliverables and the deliverables that go back to the state um, are first of all, there are their board reports that every time we have a meeting or we get phone calls, anything that's of interest that has gone through the association gets formed as a board report and gets sent to about 80 different email addresses. Um, we've done 17 board reports this last year. We're working on another one right now. We have some other deliverables. Two of the deliverables are fishing community benefit agreements. Now, you have heard of community benefit agreements. 
Fishing community benefit agreements have been around for a long time. The first bunch of fishing community benefit agreements that were ever formed were formed down in Santa Barbara, essentially after the oil spill blowout they had down there. And I want to say, guys, I'm trying to think of when that was. It was in the 60s or start, late 70s. Um, so the fishing community benefit agreement down there was basically fishermen working with a with the oil companies to try to figure out how they're going to get along, you know, and avoid each other, you know, and because oil development in, in those areas are highly problematic. There's not only crew boats running back and forth, you know, they got all this machinery and stuff that they're putting on the site. You know, there's, there's pipes and all kinds of stuff on the bottom that creates problems. So that was the first thing. The second set of fishing community benefit agreements that were significant and that were really imp important was when AT&T and, and Verizon approached fishermen in the Central Coast and wanted to land subsea cables there. Okay, there's two kinds of cables for, uh, for transmission of data. There's a submarine cable and a subsea cable. A submarine cable lays on the bottom. A subsea cable can be buried up to three meters deep. It can also not be buried, but they say up to three meters. So, so that was in 1999 that, um, that the, uh, the two phone companies basically came to land those cables. And again, they negotiated with fishermen. They put together the, the, North Co the Central Coast Fishermen's Cable Liaison Committee. That Cable Liaison Committee now has been operating for about 22 years. They get $450,000 a year from the various cables that are landed there. And again, going back to more the city of Morro Bay, that's where they ended up getting the, the funding that they're doing. So where we are right now is that we're just kind of in the early stages of getting organized here. There's been no agreements. There's been uh, no um, handshake deals, nothing with any developers, but we're in the process now where we've actually got a, something in place where we can go forward and. And, and and negotiate if indeed that happens. Um, last slide, I think. So we've kind of hit those. This is talking about, um, this is we just talked about. This is a thing of just, the fishermen aren't trying to, we're not asking for cash, asking to, to basically to avoid and minimize impacts. That's the first two things we have to do. And while a lot of younger fishermen are very concerned, we think that we can avoid a lot of the impacts that will negatively, imp you know, impact fishermen you know in this area and then the very last step in the process is actual mitigation and mitigation will end up probably being a band-aid the goal is to basically figure out some way to survive these projects for the next 30 years so i think there's one last slide no there we go we did that one and so just briefly one of the things that, that we saw here that was problematic for us, which also motivated us to do what we did, is we saw the Terrigen hearings. And fishermen knew that they were not gonna they were not gonna prevail, you know, in a situation where we had a couple minutes, three minutes to go up and get in front of people and talk. So we had basically been trying for some time to work with the city and the county, and we're starting to get some great traction from um, Sean Quincy there at the county level. And um you know, and we talk about cable mitigation. We're going to, I'm not going to bother you with that right now. Um, uh, but I will ask you if there's any questions and, and then kind of get out of your hair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You don't have to hook yet. They might have questions. Yeah. <laughs> we might have to call you back. Um, is there, are there questions from the board first? Comments? Um, comment just thank you very much and that was a really comprehensive overview and just good good to lay it out and just I know that we have a lot of new uh, board members just to see kind of the history of how you know we've worked with you guys to to create this and just what is happening going forward so thank you I guess if I could ask a, a question is, is there anything that you would be looking to for our you know from our CEA at this point you know that and he asks This does not involve money. The California Coastal Commission um, basically put together two documents, and there are federal consistency documents for the Morro Bay and the Humboldt Wind Energy areas. Contained in those reports are a set of conditions that have to be met for these projects to go forward. Condition seven requires the Coastal Commission and state agencies to form a fisherman's working group. 
and it would be it's set up to be commercial fishermen, the developers, and the state agencies to work collectively to figure out how we're going to put some rules on this because right now it's the wild west. If it turned out that sometime in the future the RCA board of directors thought that it would be beneficial to write a support letter asking that the condition seven working group be formed, you know, sooner rather than later, that would be hugely helpful. But that's the only thing I can actually do. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Um, I need to ask if um, Ken's reply could have been heard from, from, I mean, we can hear you fine in this room. Um, can people in online hear? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. Hmm. Any other comments, questions from up here before I take it to the public? Okay, um, now is time for um, public questions, comments. No hands raised. All right. Thanks, Lori. Um, yeah, I'll just follow up by saying thank you, thank you. Um, I think I was actually in the room when we had those very initial, I mean, and it's great to see it at this much progress and just does seem like a whole lot of work. So thank you. Anything else, Matthew? I don't think so. No, just you know, we'll we'll continue to work at the staff level, and I think I, I haven't gotten a brick a bedroom window yet. So you know, we're, we we could be doing worse, but we could be you know we could always do better. But um, I think we're we'll continue to work with uh, the fishermen on on that side of the equation. There's obviously lots of pieces of all this, but that's uh, an important. All right, great, thank you. All right, moving on then to item six point two. Um, staff report. Yeah, so this is an informational item and oh, quicker. Um, and so uh, we, we tabled this from last meeting and I'll, I'll go through it fairly briskly, but um, you know, we, we adopted our strategic plan and I'll fancy title slide um, that um, back in 2019, uh, we updated the strategic plan. And one of the things that we wanted to do was every, um, you know, six months, just give an update so that it doesn't just gather dust on the shelf and kind of check in on, on what we're doing uh, with the strategic plan. Um, and this is a little bit more of a, a deeper dive. And this will be a very repetitive because we did this. We also provide the same update to the community advisory committee. And so this slides will be familiar for those that were at that meeting. Um, and so just as a, as a recap, um, the strategic plan really has four areas of, of work that we do. Um, you know, based off of our mission and our JPA agreement, which is, you know, regional planning and coordination, um, which involves a lot of work kind of at the big picture and kind of things that are sort of adjacent sometimes to our, our you know, core energy activities. Um, integrated demand side management, which is the wonky um, industry term for like customer program. So demand side management just means on in the utility business, the demand side is the customer side. So, you know, things behind the customer meters, energy efficiency, um, you know, think, things that are, you know, typically uh, a lot of the, you know, bread and butter stuff we've done since our, our you know, first years. Um, and then low carbon transportation uh, and then um, energy generation, utility services, which, you know, the, the foundational part of our community choice aggregation program. And so that's the strategic plan is, is divided into those four categories. And so that's kind of how we tend to look at it, although a lot of them overlap and cross boundaries. So it's not cut and dried. Uh, so I'm just going to go through those four sections with a couple of slides each, um, and, and I'm going to highlight the goals um, uh, that are in the strategic plan and just talk about what, the, you know, the last sort of six months, you know, has really been focused on or what we're working on right now. Um, so the, the goals under planning and coordination are really to, you know, the big picture stuff, achieve uh, net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Um, really become energy secure. Um, and so not just uh, having local renewable energy to meet our needs, but also having that be um, you know, resilient uh, so that we're able to address uh, emergencies and energy disruptions. Um, and then you know, the third one is really to have the, the, the clean energy sector as uh, a big part of the economy. Obviously, Octor Wind is part of that, but also, you know, all the different things that Cal Poly Humboldt's doing and, and other, um, you know, business and research and development opportunities. So the, the, the economic development elements of, of renewable energy. Currently, um, you know, one of the things we've been working on for a while is working with the county and all the cities on um, a regional climate action plan. And so that's been 
chugging along over the last couple of years. And so we're, we're sort of technical support for that effort. We provided funding to the cities at the beginning of that process and are, are supporting it um, from sort of a, uh, an advisory capacity. And that's, um, it's had, you know, with the pandemic, there's been sort of lulls in the, in the progress, but um, I think there's gonna be some, some uh, uptick in the activity there. Um, you know, a, a big part of the resilience piece is looking at microgrids and energy resilience. And so right now we're really working with um, Calpol Hemble and, and um, you know, partnering. The, 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 there's issues we've talked about as far as the Northeast part of the county, as well as Southern Humboldt um, uh, that are, you know, have a lot of grid issues. And so trying to figure out microgrid solutions and, you know, what part we can kind of um, play to support those efforts. There's hopefully going to be some state funding for that. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll be um, uh, doing our piece. Um, and then we're also starting to talk with the county about other airport locations, because obviously the, the, the airport microgrid has been a success and the, the county uh, staff has reached out about like other opportunities because, you know, like the Fortuna airport is where Cal Fire stages out of. And obviously that's important. And, and just having those regional airports have resilience um, is important and they have land. And, you know, so there's reasons to kind of look at that. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of old news, but, you know, when we're talking about what was, you know, news in the last six months, you know, we've been working on offshore wind for many, 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 many years. And so the actual leasing process happening um, and, you know, the, 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 that sort of release, the, we're at the start line of that development process, but, um, you know, the, the next phases will be the developers working on their site assessment plans um, and studies and also kind of engaging on these community issues now that there's actually developers to talk with. You know, whether it's working with tribes or working with commercial fishermen or, you know, you know, working to address, um, you know, labor issues, you know, that can kind of has a little bit more um, meat on the bone now that we actually have developers to engage with following the, the auction. On transportation, the, the, the big picture goals are to get, you know, 6,000 electric vehicles uh, on the road by 2025 and then ramping up to to. 22,000 by um, 2030, and the state actually has, you know, subsequent to our plan, has adopted some pretty ambitious goals for electric vehicles. And so, um, you know, these these are not, um, if anything, they they may be um, less ambitious than what the state is pushing for um, in the in the big picture. Um, as far as how we're doing that, you know, developing the infrastructure to support those vehicles so that people can charge them and you know fuel them with electricity. Um, and then we're not really in the, you know, we don't manage transit, we don't manage transportation planning, but in a support capacity, working with uh, HCOG and HTA to um, help, you know, not just make the miles we're driving, you know, more uh, energy efficient and clean, but also, you know, help people get out of their cars so they don't have to drive and reduce vehicle miles traveled um, with the overall goal of trying to reduce our emissions from transportation by 2030. And so, you know, the, the target is to reduce emissions from transportation. Our role is mostly focused on the fuels part of it because that's our sort of piece of the, the pie. But we also want to acknowledge that, you know, if somebody can get out of their car and not need to drive their car, that's, you know, a lot um, more cost effective than, than just uh, driving an electric vehicle. Um, as far as, you know, towards those goals of what we're working on, you know, we have a public EV charging network that RCA owns and operates. We've got 15 um, locations across the county, and we're, we're looking to add four more sites. Uh, we also got um, several grants that we're working on from the California Energy Commission. We have a $200,000 grant that um, is to work on planning efforts for medium and heavy duty vehicles. And so looking at that you know, segment of the vehicle population and how to provide the infrastructure and to work with fleet operators to help them, uh, you know, look at low emission options for their fleets. Uh, we also got a $700,000 grant um, that's just about to get going um, that would install EV charging at rural sites around the county and particularly making sure that there's sort of that resilience component of like, hey, if somebody's got an EV that they bought out in, you know, Soames Bar, do they have somewhere to charge that, you know, and so... Um, you know, the, the focus of that, and that was a CEC uh, funding opportunity, specifically um, targeting rural communities. And so we'll be starting to deploy that grant and install sites around the county with that funding. Um, and then we have rebate programs that the board has approved that support um, 
both vehicles, uh, the infrastructure, but you know, the charging infrastructure for the you know, installing a charger at your home or your business. Sometimes panel upgrades are needed to you know, have the capacity for that. And then we're going to be doing a second round of um, electric bike rebates. Um, we had a very successful, well-adopted funding went out the door pretty quickly. Uh, uh, EV uh, e-bike rebate program, and the second round is going to be focused more on um, low-income customers. So, kind of targeting not just like, hey, you know, this is for having fun on the weekend, but really people who, you know, maybe need that other mobility option. There's going to be state rebates that are going to be focused on that as well, and so ours will be kind of complementary to that. But you know, focusing on bikes that can carry groceries and and customers that. Uh, you know, our lower income customers getting, you know, a more enhanced rebate. So it's really providing an option for them to, you know, use those for their, their transportation needs, not just for, for recreation. You know, on the, on the electric vehicle goal is just the graph of kind of where we're at. The 2022 data won't be out until April. So this is kind of, you know, once we have that, we'll update this graph, but um, the, the, the blue line is full electric vehicles. So, you know, 100% EV vehicles. Um, the green line is plug-in hybrid vehicles. So vehicles like a Chevy Volt that can run on electricity for, you know, 40, 50 miles. And then once you exceed that, it kicks over to gasoline. And so not surprisingly for a rural community, we actually have more of those plug-in hybrid vehicles that could be all electric or can convert to sort of a traditional hybrid vehicle. And so the, the total of plug-in vehicles um, gray line. And so we're, you know, we're at, as of the end of 2021, uh, a, a little over uh, uh, 1,800 vehicles um, of the, the total Humboldt County vehicle population. We have about a vehicle per person. So, um, you know, we actually think we have more vehicles than people in Humboldt County as you look at vehicle registration. Um, and so, you know, if you sort of extrapolate that line out, you know, not to be too statistic-y about it, but, um, you know, it's it's sort of a it's a growing curve. There was sort of a weird dip because you know, if anybody tried to buy a used or new car in the last couple of years, it's been a bleak scene on car lots, um, and so it's a little hard to kind of like know where the future is going. But um, you know, if you just trust the statistics, we're still going to hit a little short of that goal if we kind of just say, hey, give me the data and the trend line, which is a pretty um, you know statistically valid trend line. But it's we're not quite getting up to that six thousand number. Um, you know, by by the end of 2025 yet. So I think this is one where we want to kind of, you know, figure out strategy and we obviously can't control the supply chain issues that have been impacting just car sales globally. But, um, you know, so we're, 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 it's moving, but it's not maybe quite on the line we want it to be. Um, and I'll just say to the CAC, you know, one of the things they ask is we kind of do these qualitative reports and the CAC suggested we kind of give some dashboard kind of numbers like that, just kind of say, well, what are the stats, you know? Um, and so we're going to do more of that, but this is kind of the first version to have those kind of data. And that was a CAC recommendation that we're implementing. So on our, our integrated demand side management, also known as customer energy solutions to, to human beings, um, the goals are to really support um, installation of customer solar energy systems to reach 30 megawatts by 2025 and 50 megawatts by 2030. Scotia biomass plant is like about 30 megawatts, give or take, depending on how you look at it. Um, uh, for scale, the, the pg e gas plant is 160 megawatts, if you don't think in megawatt terms. Um, the airport microgrid is like two and a half megawatts. So, you know, if you're thinking about how many megawatts that means. Um, and also to provide energy efficiency and conservation services to basically every household in, in the county that wants it. And so to make that available and, um, you know, we're, we're at our 20 year anniversary and we've been doing this particular goal for a long time. And so one of the things we want to kind of mine our data for is how many households we actually serve. Because especially in the early days, we would do like thousands of households a year doing like community neighborhood suites with the California Conservation Corps and things like that. And so um, we want to make sure that, you know, everyone has access to those services in the entire county. Um, we want to reduce natural gas consumption, you know, uh, and, and that involves, you know, both conservation, but also, um, you know, electrification and, and helping people adopt, um, you know, heat pumps and, and other technology that helps them get off of imported natural gas, fossil fuel use. Um, and then this is one of those ones that crosses a lot of, of these different goals is helping to deploy microgrids, as well as just renewable backup power systems 
um, at critical facilities across the county and really want to like say, hey, you know, every critical facility should have, you know, backup power. And, you know, the more resilient and renewable that is, it both reduces emissions and also provides economic benefits when the power isn't out and there isn't an emergency. You know, and I think we saw that with um, the earthquake and the, the subsequent storms, you know, we'd worked with the city of Rio Del and, 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 you know, they were able to use the solar battery system that um, we helped them install to, to have power during the earthquake. Trinidad had a, their solar and battery system at their town hall, provided a warming station and a charging station for, for residents. And so, you know, those kinds of systems are not quite as glamorous as the airport microgrid, which gets a lot of attention because it's just solar and batteries, but, um, you know, and they also have, you know, other backup generators There's another layer of that, but, um, you know, the, those kinds of systems that maybe don't get quite as much, um, you know, media attention um, can really play an important part in an emergency. And then again, provide economic climate benefits. The other 364 days or at this rate, the other 320 days, I'm not sure how many days we're going to have power at this rate, but, um, you know, it's been, it's been a busy winter for, for these kinds of systems. Um, and so uh, not just fancy microgrids, but also kind of bread and butter stuff. You know, and, and the, the customer energy solution program, this is, you know, it's our biggest staff team. And sometimes we kind of just throw out some stats and it kind of, a lot of times there aren't board action items that we bring. And so, you know, we, we just wanted to highlight to you all um, and you're, you know, bring back to your constituents that, you know, we work with folks that, you know, provide them with um, ways to manage their energy use, their costs, you know, their, their environmental impacts, whatever their goals are, you know, we provide those types of assistance. Um, we'll help put people access not just our program, but whatever programs are out there. So it might be referring them to Redwood Community Action Agency for low-income weatherization or other statewide programs for businesses. Um, and you know, really, it's it's sort of like whatever's out there. If we need to refer it, you know, we're not we're not like hung up on people participating in our programs. Um, it's really about what you know what the customers' needs are and. Um, helping them figure out those needs, what they're eligible for. And then, you know, we'll actually make direct referrals and help them sign up for those other programs. Um, and then, you know, for public agencies, we provide an extra layer of like technical assistance and project management. So helping them write grants to get those solar arrays, you know, so the, with Rio Dell, we had helped them get the funding lined up to do that and get the bids from contractors. And um, we just, you know, got contacted by Rio Dell staff to, apply for some uh, additional funding and help them with that so they can do another round of, of this kind of, um, you know, solar storage uh, work. Um, and so, you know, for, for public agencies, we kind of do additional support. Um, and that's not just our member governments, that's, um, you know, any special district or, or you know, fire department or, or any um, public agency. Um, and then we do workshops and education and, and outreach. You know, Current programs, we have um, ratepayer funded um, CPUC dollars um, that provides, um, you know, equipment installation and rebates. So, you know, we have sort of turnkey services where you can actually sign up to get stuff installed as well as um, rebates and incentives to help just buy down the cost of those types of installations. And that's uh, $1.9 million of funding from the state that's going to wrap up at the end of June. Um, we also have a partnership program with pg e which is kind of that's like our first funding, which was the local government commission, now Civic Well, um, got us state funding to launch our CEA. And that was really, you know, in this sort of partnership structure with the utility. And so, you know, this is the legacy of, you know, our very first dollar we ever spent was basically uh, a version of this local government partnership with PG&E. Um, it's much smaller than it actually used to be because we've started to do these other things and administer it directly. But we still do have that relationship. Um, and our our three quarters of a million dollar program um, that was uh, ending this June, just got another million dollars added to it for another two and a half years through uh, the end of 2027. And that's really focused on uh, outreach education, technical assistance, not like rebates per se, but um, you know, more the, the, the front end of the process for customers. Um, we got a tech quick clean California quick start grant, um, which is basically supporting um, heat pump incentives and, and installations for customers um, that are using uh, propane or kerosene. And if, if you've been at this, like the, the dollars we usually have are very limited to like, did you pay a bill that's under the CPUC authority? So, you know, a utility, electricity or natural gas bill. So propane customers often aren't eligible for incentives. And so this was sort of a, 
a carve out to address that um, gap. Um, and then we have programs that the board has approved for, for internal funding from our CEA, uh, which includes, you know, our solar net energy program for, for our uh, solar customers get a enhanced compensation compared to what PG&E offers. Um, we provide technical assistance to our sort of key account services to public agencies um, and also large commercial customers. So, um, you know, we have some big, you know, like a big wedge of our actual like revenue customer base is, is some very large um, commercial customers. And it's pretty standard for whether it's public or private utilities to provide sort of like a little bit of like, Hey, you know, are you, you know, how can we help you make sure that you're, you know, meeting your needs and, and, you know, using your power cost effectively and, and ensuring that those customers are, are, um, you know, uh, efficient and effective in their energy use. Um, we provide free residential energy kits, which is something that the board, you know, uh, that we're funding internally. Um, we package up, this was a pandemic year thing where we package up a kit and send it to folks. They can pick it up in the office too. But when, when we, we used to go out and install it ourselves, and then it was like when we couldn't do that anymore, we're like, okay, so we pivoted to sort of having a phone consultation and giving them a customized kit and then, you know, mailing that to them or, or letting them come in and pick it up. Um, you know, now they can actually come in the office and pick it up. <laughs> but um, And then we have heap up rebates that we supplement our other rebates with um, as far as RCA funding. And then um, the, the community grid program, which is the, the partnership we have as Swell that is um, working with battery storage customers to basically give them an incentive to be part of a virtual power plant. So when the grid needs power, their battery systems can respond to, to you know, sort of grid, you know, RCEA power needs not just their own kind of site needs. And so, you know, they still have that system for their needs, but it's, it's a way to sort of use those through a, an aggregation of, of the, the, the controls um, through software to be able to say, oh, we need power at, you know, 6 p.m. Friday night. And, you know, you can send that signal out to all those batteries and then they get an incentive for participating. So it gives the, the customer some money. On, on the PV target, and that's one that we, you know, in our strategic planning update, we heard a lot from customers. Um, this basically just shows, you know, the, the yellow is the, the prior year cumulative, and then the blue is what was added in that year. Obviously, we're just in the beginning of 2023, so there's not a lot added yet in 2023. But um, where we are as of, I think this was as of February, um, you know, we're at about, uh, you know, close to 23 megawatts of rooftop solar, at, you know, out of our... Um, 30 megawatt target for 2025. So I'd say we're, we're, we're pretty well on track. You know, you, you heard last meeting about the changes to the state net metering rules. And so how much of a chilling effect that will have on this trajectory, I think remains to be seen. And we're still obviously kind of analyzing how to respond to that um, with our own rates and programs. Um, but, you know, to date, this is one where I would say we're, we're actually, um, you know, the, 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 the path to success is, is, is pretty on track. You know, um, in 2020 to 2022, we've been adding, you know, three to five plus megawatts per year. And so, you know, we would we would hit the goal in three years. And so I think we're, um, you know, uh, we're, we're well, we're well on a trajectory, even if, if things slow down a little bit, we should still be able to hit this goal unless they really just hit a, a brick wall. So um, this one is is uh, going pretty well. Um, and then last on this front is just that, you know, you, you've, I think many of you heard what we're working on a, a rural regional energy network or rural REN, which is a state funding mechanism through the CPUC. And so uh, you know, it's been, it was about a year ago, a little over a year ago that we submitted an application um, to the Public Utility Commission for a $90 million four-year statewide program to provide energy efficiency services across the state. And that includes electrification, energy efficiency, workforce development, um, you know, a, a sort of suite of programs uh, around uh, building energy efficiency. Um, you know, it's a statewide program. So these different regions are part of this overall um, uh, joint proposal with partners from across the state. We're, we're basically the lead applicant. So we, you know, we would be the administrator of this, but the $90 million wouldn't all be coming to Humboldt. It would be, um, uh, you know, a, a statewide rural uh, regions uh, funding opportunity. So hopefully we're going to, you know, be on track to get that approved. It's still going through the regulatory process. 
Um, the hope is that that funding would start at the beginning of 2024, if, if not perhaps slightly sooner than that, but then it's got to work through the approval process. And then lastly, just on the utility side of things, um, our big picture goals are to get to 100% um, you know, clean and renewable resources. You know, so the, the state goal doesn't consider um, you know, most hydroelectric power is actually renewable. And so that's one of the things in our portfolio in the near term, sometimes we, we procure some of that um, uh, to, to sort of backfill um, the, the eligible renewable power. Um, and then, you know, by 2030, we'd like to see that really be focused on, you know, as much as possible, humble resources. Um, so we're not relying on power from outside of the, the county, which often can't actually physically get here. So it's more of a contractual relationship than a, than a you know, uh, electrons serving the community basis. Um, and, you know, that ties in with offshore wind and being, you know, overall a net exporter. Um, and then again, this cross-cutting one, if we want to be able to respond to disruptions to the grid and have, you know, our energy needs be locally and have resilience um, baked into to how we're providing utility service. Um, you know, big, big things this last year, we had the, the airport project, you know, began operations just before Christmas of, uh, you know, 2020. One, um, but during 2022, um, we actually went live with the, the island and capabilities and had the ribbon cutting in uh, June. And, and um, then it, it definitely got a, it, we've been, you know, we've been fine tuning the system and dialing it in and doing kind of the commissioning once it got up and running. And then it definitely got a, a workout um, during the winter emergencies and continues to, to uh, get some exercise. I think it, it went into island mode while we were in the middle of the CAC meeting. I got a text that said, the microgrid is now islanded from the grid because the grid went down. And so um, it's been happening a lot. Um, uh, and you know, we have 24 seven coverage with our staff and the, the Shots and Research Center folks. Um, you know, we, we're, we're in the early process of you know, prioritizing working with um, the, the customers that are served by the Hoopa and Willow Creek substations, which is basically anyone in the eastern part of the county, the Hoopa substation serves all the way up to Siskiyou County and um, you know, anything north of Willow Creek, basically. And um, you know, the, the folks at Cal Poly Humble have been supporting the Yurok tribe and the Karuk tribe and uh, uh, Hoopa tribe with, um, uh, they're part of a state grant proposal that will hopefully bring um, dollars. It's a state grant proposal to the federal government. So the state is applying on behalf of a number of tribes to, for federal funding to um, uh, develop uh, like energy resilience, renewable energy systems. Uh, and so, you know, we're uh, backing that up in the ways that RCEA, you know, uh, can play a role in that. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's, it's in the proposal stage, but I think it's, the odds are probably pretty good that that will get funded, I would think. Um, uh, and then we just issued um, fairly recently a solicitation um, for some of our compliance goals. But, um, you know, we're, we're hoping that, you know, we can see local projects whenever possible fit into those compliance targets. And um, just on the procurement side of things, I won't spend too much time on this, but on sort of the dashboard, you know, in, in November, this is where we were at as far as the, the dark green is renewable power under the state rules. The light green is um, uh, carbon free. So that's usually out of state hydro, some in state hydro. Um, you know, we just, I think, um, signed a deal with San Francisco for some of their hydropower, but mostly it's it's Oregon, Washington kind of hydropower. Um, we don't buy anything from the Klamath Dams, just for the record, that's the policy that we have. Um, and so um, it's 2021, 2022, 23, 24 on this. And so, um, you know, we, we dialed a lot back in 2021 um, because of the financial situation. 2022, we should be pretty close. The, the blue line is our goal as far as just the RCA board adopted kind of goal and trajectory. Um, the the um, or purple and blue lines, because text is a little bit small here, is the, the, the state renewable portfolio obligation. So um, the... The purple line is what we have to do for the state. So the, the, the green bar has to meet the purple bar, basically. The, the blue line is the RCA board goal for just renewables. And then the, the light blue one on top is the, the overall you know, renewable and carbon-free target um, for uh, 2025 goals. Um, and so we're, we're 2022 is looking. We haven't gotten the final 
you know, audited numbers, but um, it's looking pretty good. Um, 2023, we have not done all of our procurement, so it's not necessarily going to like, you know, uh, you know, this isn't the end result for 2023, but it's where we're at, you know, sort of where we were looking at November. And I put November here because I'm going to show another one. And then 2024, it's ramping up. A big part of that green bar renewable is the Sandrini Solar Project. Um, and so when you look at February, now 2024 didn't really change much. If you look at the last one, it's the same. 2023 dropped way down, and that's the delay in the Sandrini Solar Project. And so, um, you know, when we found out that they had the, you know, the issue, there's there's panels sitting in a boat waiting to be unloaded once they pass customs, um, and they're just waiting to get the sign off for that. And so, the the multi month delay um, is what you know has changed, um, and what we're looking at right now. Um, that said, again, this is not the end result. You know, that could hopefully come online sooner, but probably not. But we're going to be doing additional procurement to you know get us. To top us up for the rest of the year. So just, you know, I think part of the story is, you know, even just a couple of months where, you know, when we're dealing with these projects, you know, we can say, oh, we're, you know, on track. And then like, oh, we got a project delay. Once it's built, there still can be things happen. But, you know, um, these are just some of the factors we're having to manage. And then just lastly, you know, this is sort of the, the big picture. So the, the green is again, the renewables, the blue is the carbon free, which is the large hydro, really. We don't buy nuclear power. So it's, it really just comes down to large hydro. Uh, and then the gray is just sort of system power, you know, other power. And so the first few years, you know, the, the actual power mix um, up through uh, 2021, you know, as I mentioned, you know, when the pandemic hit in, you know, 2022, 2020 and 21, we dialed back a lot to just save money. Um, that 2022 number is more of an actual, it might even be a little bit better than that. And so the, the if I, can I, I think this has a laser on it, let's see. Yeah. The people at home can't see my laser, but um, so this is 2021, you know, it was okay. not what we want to be, but we saved money and kind of circled the wagons or whatever. And, and then this is where I think we're going to be close or maybe even better for 2022. And then this is our goal to, again, by 2030, get up to hundred percent renewable, um, you know, getting off of the, the, the large hydro, but um, the overall goal is by 2025 to, to be at, you know, no, no, um, fossil resources in our mix by 2025, and then phase out the, the more affordable or large hydro for 100% renewables. And again, I, I think we're going to be back on track in 2022, and, and then we're going to aim for 2023, 24 to be where you know, our goals were, were set in for us. So um, we're, we're going to try to put 2021 and block it out of our memories because it, <laughs> it was a challenging year, but uh, we're, we're luckily, I think, past it. And, and just one other way to look at slice and dice this as we're talking about um, procurement is the orange bars are long-term contracts and then the, the blue is short-term contracts. And so, you know, in, in 2020, you know, we, we have, you know, some, mostly the, the Scotia plant um, is a long-term contract. So that's more than 10 year contract. The solid is what we have. The light is what we're aiming for, but don't have actually under contract yet. And so in 2020, we had, you know, Humble Sawmill Company. We had some, you know, some long-term contracts, but mostly we were doing these short-term, you know, one year or so contracts. In 2023, we're going to be bigger because if Sandrini had not been delayed, but with the Sandrini delay, we're going to have to rely more on short-term contracts to top up. Um, and then, you know, we still have some gap to fill there. And then when Sandrini comes online, we're going to have a, a big chunk of our overall, you know, 100% is our this is our total power mix. And so once Sandrini is online, we have long-term contracts for renewables that are exceeding 50% of our load. And then in 2026, we're going to you know, still have this gap. And by 2030, we hope to have really, you know, the majority of our mix in long-term contracts with a little bit of short-term contracts to, you know, to top up because load changes. And, you know, it's a windy year. It's a, it's a not windy year. You know, you have to kind of fill in the gaps. And then uh, this is my last slide on this. Is just you know is a little feature you know the the airport microgrid came online um, and you know it got put to the test you know the really the worst case scenario with the earthquake it was like <clears throat> second shortest day of the year as far as sunlight and it was right in the evening when the sun goes down so the batteries were at their you know their lowest state of charge because we discharge into the market in the evening when power is expensive and so like 
the duck curve of like power is expensive in the evening, cheap in the daytime. We discharge the batteries to make money in the, the evening hours. And so, you know, it hit right after that evening discharge on that really short day. And so, um, but it, it performed better than expected and, and um, you know, was able to, to operate. And then it's gotten, I don't know how many times it's had to go into island mode for various periods of time from short to long for the various storms we've had. Um, we've been getting a lot of, you know, media acknowledgement of the the fact that the the system has been up and running and that's something that came up at the CAC meeting. We should you know, send the links to these articles if people want to actually look at the, the articles themselves. Um, and you know we've we've said this before, but I think it's it's kind of um, come to light additionally that you know this project has really you know been a lot of work and a lot of cost and a lot of effort, but it's become a model for how the state is looking at doing these kinds of um, microgrid projects, you know, and, and a lot of the work that is being proposed and hopefully funded up in the northeast part of the county and potentially in, in southern Humboldt um, uh, is based off of the, the things we've figured out by this pilot project. So I think it's, you know, something that we should be pretty, pretty proud of. So um, and I think that's my, my last slide. So I'm happy to, you know, it's kind of a, a fire hose of information and went into a little bit more of the the big picture goals since we have a lot of new folks, but I'm happy to answer any questions there are. All right, thank you, Matthew. Yep, questions from the board for Matthew. Oops. Go ahead, Nelly. Hi there, thank you. This was really helpful. Um, I guess I was feeling a little bit inspired to explore the topic of opting out versus opting into 100% renewables. And I wondered if you could just fill me in on what this board's previous position on that has been, and then whether we would be able to kind of uh, procure enough power to, to make that kind of move. And I, I'm not, you know, I know it's not agendized, so I'm not proposing that we delve into the topic now, but I just want to kind of understand the history about um, about that. Um, yeah, so so you know we 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 set the goal and you know and our our 2025 goal is basically um, accelerating the state's goal by 20 years. So they're the, the same that that goal is the state's goal for 2045. Um, you know we we have been one of the factors has been wanting to maintain rates that are not higher than pg &E. So rates are you know, basically the same as pg &E, very slightly lower. Um, and so, you know, that that's a factor in the decision making. If we were just going to say, you know, 100% renewable full speed ahead, then, you know, we, we would have to look at what the rate implications of that have been, you know, and again, that's why when you looked at the, the ugly picture of 2021, the board opted to say, let's keep rates, you know, let's manage the rates and and not you know and, and dial back our environmental goals because it was the pandemic and you know there's a lot of challenges and so um so we you know there's the opportunity to revisit you know the the timeline and the trajectory for that um if you want to so to put a finer point on it would we be able to supply 100 percent Renewables to the majority. Uh, I mean, the the you know, if we we're asking people to opt out only, um, do you think we would have the capacity to serve that need? You mean if 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 we we're saying we're going to provide 100% power, and if you don't want that, you can opt out. Correct. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll say that there there is a there's a, another alternative that some other um, communities have uh, gone with, where the default is 100%. You can opt down to like a lower cost product, but then, or you could opt out. So you can always opt out to PG&E, you know, and so it would be making, because we have a hundred percent renewable option right now. And so you could set it up, you know, where the default is the hundred percent option, which right now is like a penny a kilowatt hour more um, than our base product. Um, so you could make that the default, give people the opportunity to opt down. Cause right now you opt up to hundred percent. Um, but they wouldn't necessarily, you know, we wouldn't have to set it up where it's like, we'll take 100% or, or just opt out entirely. You could have, you know, the, the opt down option instead of opt up. And a number of communities in, in Southern California have, have gone with that model. And, you know, and sometimes 
some CCAs have offered that on a jurisdictional basis. So one CCA, they're like, hey, we want our default to be the, you know, the cost model and some other jurisdictions are like, no, we want our default to be the 100% option. But, and and thank you for clarifying. That is what I meant. That the default for our communities, um, at least hypothetically, in this line of questioning, be a hundred percent renewables. There be the opt down um, option, and then of course also the opt out. Um, so I yeah, I just didn't know what the conversation had been before now about that. Yeah, I I think we we didn't put too much. We haven't put too much focus on that. Because, you know, I, I think the big picture goal is to just like make it a moot point as quickly as we can, you know, and again, we're trying to be cost conscious, but, you know, ideally by 2030, there would make no difference because we, everyone would be in this, you know, there would be no opt up or opt down because that would just be the default. Um, and really by 2025, you know, it'd be pretty comparable products. Um, so I think we've, we've tried to put more of our effort into getting to that big picture goal than kind of having different offerings, but we certainly could have that be a topic of conversation. Okay. Uh, anybody else from the board? I remember that conversation and um, opting out. My ears pricked up, Natalie, when you said opt out. I was like, no, no, we don't want anybody to opt out. That, we want that's, them to yeah, stay in. I misspoke. I meant, you know, I meant making 100% renewables the default. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, anybody from the public? Um, now is the time we're on item 6.2. Yep. All right. Well, then um, I'm going to close 6.2, move on to 6.3, RCEA. CAC annual report, and um, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna stand up for a minute here because I'm gonna be able to pay attention. <laughs> and I, Matthew, that was a long that was a long report. Thank you. Okay, ready. <laughs> okay, that that's me. I'm Dennis Leonardi, and uh, just to give you a quick, uh, I'm a 50. I've been daring for 50 years. Um, been involved in lots of industry organizations and appointments. Uh, tw I've been 20 years involved in uh, healthcare delivery in Humboldt County. Uh, if you've been down to a tractor parade in Ferndale, you've probably seen one of our floats, and I'm really excited to be part of our CACAC committee. Um, I don't, you guys probably all realize this, but this is really a cutting edge group in the state of California as far as what we're doing and how far we've come along and, and what we're actually delivering for a community, which most people in the community don't realize. And you'll get uh, part of that outreach is some of the report here. I wrote a few notes down so I don't go on forever because I know time is valuable. We meet like every other month. But before we start, a couple of things. Um, the fisherman's report, I just remembered. Um, the dairy industry did something like that with a, a multi-agency group, a, a working group ahead of time with organizations, regulatory folks, how to apply our regional water quality uh, requirements. So we had a working group for a couple, three years, talk through it, and it was very effective. You got all that stuff out on the table in a casual environment. It was constructive out the end. Um, so much for that. <clears throat> First, I'd like to thank Lori, who's sitting over there on the side, for keeping us organized and on track and scripted. Without her help, it'd be very difficult, uh, very difficult to do. Uh, Nancy, who also helped during the pandemic, getting us assisted in our meeting details. Matthew, for all these uh, fire hose of report, they're all like that. Every single line of those reports is a big activity. He delivers a report like that every time. Everyone really appreciates it, and everyone has questions. Um, we've got great reports from Eileen, um, Richard, Aisha, 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 get her name right. Everybody on staff is top drawer and always delivers great reports and has uh, really great responses to questions. They're all very prepared. My goal as a chair is very simple, is to make sure every person around the room, at least some point in the meeting, is engaged and contributes. And so far, that's been relatively easy to do because... It happens real regularly. Hopefully you all read the minutes. The minutes are probably a better synopsis of anything I could give you because they contain lots of detail of what we're doing. 
If you look on the page up there, almost every one of you will know someone on that list. It's a very diverse, intelligent, engaged group of folks. And we appreciate that on the board. We're counting a lot on our board liaisons to bring our message back to you. Thank you for your last meeting. And uh, hopefully that will be giving you lots of stuff to share with this group in the meantime. And one of the things I think is really important, there's a wide range of discussion that always occurs. And I'm a dairyman. There's guys that are in the solar industry. There's, you know, people from shops. There's just this great group of folks that are really bright and engaged. And that just stimulates lots and lots of real positive discussion. And that to me is very rewarding. And I think that's kind of what you want. We start on page 51 on our report. So I'm just going to flip through. I think there's a couple of slides here. I'm going to highlight a couple of things. There's 10 on this work accomplished, there's 10 things there. You heard some stuff on Repower Humboldt, the net energy metering success. That's that's a very interesting topic that I think you're gonna probably deal with more. We spent some time on that. Offshore wind obviously is a big ticket item and it's had lots of discussion. What you'll see, one of the things as we go through community outreach, I think folks in the community have this idea about wind, but they don't know anything about wind. And that's part of our job at least what we've been generating as far as discussion is. So what does a community need to hear? What makes sense to them? And that's kind of the discussion that sort of boiled up. And I think it it's surprising the preconceived and the, the actual and what may be going on, especially what's going on on the East Coast. So that kind of discussion has been very fluid. Biomass has been a big topic of discussion. Um, we took a tour down to Redwood, Humboldt Redwood. It was very interesting. The grid issues, we all know about them. We've had interesting discussions. That's come up on some of the little the projects about doing, you've seen the Arcata microgrid or the airport. Well, how about one out of Hoopa, maybe out of Southern Humboldt. Southern, Southern Humboldt has a, a healthcare uh, facility that needs to get built. They don't have power for it. And if the power goes out, you know, what do the hoop off folks do? So anyway, we have those kinds of discussions that have been very meaningful. Biomass, uh, I think the on the next slide, the technical advisory group, we had some discussion on that and the recommendation, you've probably seen it, uh, like the people should be part of that, to have that ongoing discussion. And what's most important is just not to let it sit on the shelf. So that you get that input, you put them together, you meet and you talk about it and you keep it alive because it's gonna change as technology changes and having a really, a, I don't know what the right term is, uh, folks that are industry experts on it, have that discussion and developing the policies. I think it's really important. And that's what we basically recommended to you. The bond financing is that that's, you can read through that. That's kind of goes to the Southern Humboldt and the Northern Northern Eastern Humboldt about, you know, your microgrids and how having to serve the population in this community better than we do or more resiliently, especially if you look at some of those areas, they're the more underserved and more vulnerable populations that I think we should all be somewhat from a healthcare background. Uh, they need to have this and that resilient support that we probably can help engineer with some thoughtful dissertation. Uh, climate action plan, a lot of that goes to the repower Humboldt and all the kinds of things you talk about. Uh, I want to flip to the offshore wind. I'm, you guys have seen all this. This is, I think, one of the most important things we probably all should be working on. It's going to be a laborious process. It's a, it involves a lot of players, you know, Humboldt Bay, and you have the offshore folks and all the federal and state regulatory folks. So getting accurate information out how we integrate that into the community is going to be important. So our committee has a, uh, a wealth of opinions on what that should look like. And I think it reflects accurately what the pulse is in the community. Cause there, if you looked at the membership, it's, you know, very different and very, um, you know, spread around the County. So that's one of the things that we, uh, or spending some time on it. And if you go back to the work goals, we came to the conclusion early on last year that having annual work and with the help of some staff here, our annual work goals, annual is just too short a time frame. So the suggestion was to stretch it out over two years. So it makes some sense. And that may be even too short because these are all going to be ongoing things. So um, 
So we, instead of just redoing it every year, it's kind of a flow thing. Do it every couple of years. Community outreach is, here it's A, but I think it's number one. It's one, to have a community, a Humboldt with 136,000 people, that's almost 100% renewable energy right now, or pretty close to it, pretty phenomenal. And what goes on and what can get as a model for other communities like us. Um, and you can read through, monitor and advocate for the repower, support, help guide offshore community wind outreach, um, new and expanding customer programs. So when programs come up, they float them up, we vet them, we talk about them, and hopefully the input gets you know driven back. Identifying priorities, we've gone over some of that. Um, these are big picture items that have a lot of legs underneath each stool. They're very aggressive. You're all part of that. We give you our input or our two bits with it, or maybe sometimes 50 cents worth along the way. But I think what we most appreciate, and I, I'm gonna speak kind of generally for the whole group. I think we most appreciate the opportunity to sit down and be part of what you do, delivering power in Humboldt County. It's, it's important. It's an ambitious goal and everyone is very engaged and to, to a person, very heartfelt at everything they contribute and say. And so I just want to convey that to you and thank you for the opportunity to share this sort of brief report and, um, and, go, and good luck. You really have a pretty unbelievably great opportunity and a job to do. So thanks. Thank you, Dennis. And if I could just add one thing to that. So, you know, one, just, you know, we've been at the staff level, very appreciative of all the, the CAC's time. And it's like, they're definitely um, a very engaged, thoughtful group. Um, you know, going back to that, like our power procurement goals and where we're headed, um, you know, for our 2030 targets, um, for those that have been with us for a while, um, you know that every two years we have to develop a like 10 year strategic plan that's called an integrated resource plan. And so every utility load serving entity has to develop that and submit it to the public utility commission. And then that gets rolled up into a master sort of, you know, um, plan. It's a pretty technical process and there's a lot of things that we have to follow a lot of rules as we do that, but, um, and we update it every two years. So it's sort of a living planning document. It's not, you know, a set in stone, like, uh, procurement obligation. Um, and so something that we thought of doing and then got sort of paused during the pandemic was in the in the in-between years, because that actual plan document is very sort of technical and you know the, and the process we have to follow to do it is kind of this timeline and uh, is is very prescriptive. What we you know wanted to do in the interim years is have a little bit of breathing room to get more public input on what the kind of what the goals are that are informing that plan. And so you know a lot of times when we bring stuff to the board, it's kind of like we've had to scramble to meet the CPUC deadlines and give you some numbers. And and so um, we're in an, an interim year now in 2023. The next um, actual formal plan will be due in 2024. And so what we want to do this year is, is get more community input on, you know, sort of the, the goals that go into what that plan ultimately reflects. Um, and so I think that's going to be something really this spring that we're going to be bringing to the community advisory committee to kind of lead on looking at kind of the options we have and the trade-offs of like, well, is it rates? Is it renewables? Is it local? Is it not local? You know, all those different, you know, uh, balance points. And so working with the, the community advisory committee and, and kind of having some enhanced public outreach, get input that we can then bring to you all. And then that can kind of give us uh, some information for what then gets baked into that technical document that we have to submit in 2024. So it's not, it's not in the goals, but as we've been kind of thinking about how to approach this, I think having the CAC play a central role in that makes a lot of sense. And so we'll be working with Dennis and the team on that outreach. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew. Um, anybody from the board have questions for either staff or for Dennis? I just have a comment. I, I have served on a lot of committees, which I know everybody here has. I have to say that in the meeting that you directed, just as your report here, very concise to the point, Everyone had a chance to communicate what they wanted to. It was really refreshing. 
Well, thank you. To be part of that. Nice. And I'll just add from going to your guys' meetings as well, just the technical expertise and the range in different fields that everybody has on that committee is, is something impressive. So your guys' input is very valuable. And just it, it is phenomenal. I mean, um, I, I can't say enough. I, I just learned so much every time. What go, you know, I mean, just the expertise that's and there. People are free to share it. They're not hoarding their, you're free to share what they know. All right. Okay. Um, who are our liaisons right now? Chris, Sarah? Not me anymore. Oh, okay. Who is <laughs> it's one and a... Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, public, did I do the public yet? Okay. Um, yeah, now is um, time for public comment. Item 6.3. Uh, okay. So thank you everybody for item 6.3. And I'm gonna move on to 6.4. Yeah. Yeah, so um, this item is just to, to review the existing subcommittees. And we, we, we addressed a couple previously like the building relocation subcommittee and the finance committee um, since they were time sensitive. But um, right now they, Three, right? Uh, three, well, we have the office relocations that's still on here. Um, and then there was a offshore wind subcommittee that's sunsetted because it was set to go through the auction and the auction happened. So that was, uh, you know, th there could be a new committee formed at a later date if you want it or now, but, um, you know, I think we'd figure out what the, the mission there was. But um, the, the, the current committees we have are the, um, Zero Emission Resource Midterm Reliability Solicitation, which the, what that is, um, is, you know, to is a, a reiteration of that, just as a reminder, um, for some of our, our power procurement solicitations, the actual contract numbers are confidential because we don't publish that because it's compromises our competitive market advantage if we put that out there of like, well, you're willing to pay X dollars. So... But, um, and so one of the things that came up was like, well, how does the board have visibility into like, is this a good deal? Is it a bad deal? What other offers did we get? And so having an ad hoc committee that can just kind of you know, look over staff's shoulder and sort of see, okay, you know, so even if we're not sharing the actual specific dollar numbers or, you know, some of those commercial terms, you know, there's board visibility into, you know, what that is and how it compared to the other offers. And so that, you know, somebody on the board can say, yeah, we saw everything that came in and, you know, this was the best deal or, you know. Um, or, or could bring back concerns if they, you know, think that it's maybe not a good deal. That there, there's someone to advocate for that, you know, at the board level. Um, uh, on, on Nordic Aqua Farms, and, and this is one where uh, the current members of the committee are no longer board members, so it could use some volunteers. It, it hasn't really been active yet, but um, the board approved um, uh, a policy where we could negotiate. Um, non-standard rates with like very large customers, which can be advantageous to us and the customer. So it's not like a subsidy from residential customers to Nordic. It would actually potentially benefit, you know, and one of the things in the policy is it has to be neutral to our other customers, not a, a pass-through subsidy from our customers. But, um, you know, because that involves negotiating something unique and, and different, um, having a board, you know, committee to just kind of Work with staff to say, hey, this is what you know we're coming up with um, to to provide some some guidance and input on that, um, and then the last one, um, the office relocation, which we we already re-upped, and so um, and I don't think we actually ended up having any new board members since that meeting, um, but um, so this would just be a chance to uh, yeah. To... Your rock wasn't. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. And oh, so, so we do. So that yeah, that's the other. If if um, I don't know, Director Provo wants to volunteer. <laughs> Director, you you can volunteer your colleagues for any of these committees you want. You know, um, <laughs> I'll consult with him first. Yeah, <laughs> and we can always add folks at a you know, and it's not like this is the once and done. But um, so that's that's the report. I think there's just the one committee that doesn't have any active okay members for, and then if there was anybody that wanted to. Okay, so it looks like um, staff wanted direction on determine whether work of all active 
board ad hoc subcommittees is still required. And so um, the off so yes on the office relocation. Yeah. Matthew? I hope so, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes on the Nordic Aqua Farms traits thing. And yes on the midterm reliability solicitations, right? Um Let's go for that one first and discuss that. Is there anybody from the board who um, wants to comment on whether we need these three um, ad hoc subcommittees? What do you see the, the work of the, because I, I, I know there's kind of been an ebb and flow with what's been going on with Nordic. And so, I mean, upcoming, do you think that's going to be an active subcommittee or do you think I mean, should we leave it in the hopes that we'll be able to, you know, make those negotiations when the time comes? Assuming they move forward, then then yes, you know, I mean, I think the you know their their permitting process is kind of you know um, chugging along, but we haven't heard anything that says they're you know they're pulling out yet or something like that. So, um, you know, the the negotiation on utility rates is kind of been obviously kind of a second tier priority compared to the overall permitting. Um, so, you know, we, we could kind of shelve it until there's activity and then bring it back and say, Hey, okay, now we're actually talking shop with these guys. Does anybody want to engage? So, you know, we could just, since it has been dormant, we could just leave it for now. That sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That works. They'd like to do keep them. All right. Good. Okay, so that's that direction to the board. So then that takes care of it. Just oh, type ahead. up because I don't think you Sorry. can see me. <laughs> Sorry, um, I didn't see you. Natalie. All good. Yeah, um, they've indicated their like their plans to continue proceeding, um, but obviously there's some permitting and um, other delays. So um, yeah, I, I think that I, I just concur that that sounds wise. Um, also happy to serve on that committee if it's helpful since that's in my district, but um, I know right now you're taking comment on whether we still need all of these. So um, they, they, they've um, they've not, they've, they've continued to meet with um, Humboldt County political folk about the project moving forward. Good, thank you, Natalie. Um, so it sounds like staff has direction. Should I go out to the public now? Does anybody else want to say anything? Okay, um, we're on item 6.4 and time for public comment. Okie dokie. So um, I well, think- Are we going to appoint people to that committee now too? Is that part of this item just- Oh, I thought we had decided direction was to kind of wait okay. until we- is that yeah, so okay. my understanding? Just waiting, that one for now or shelving it. I, the other two have fresh appointments unless there's somebody who wants to change. Thanks. Everybody good? All right. So that was 6.4. Um, moving on to new business 7.1. Yeah. Do you want me to kick this one off? Or? Sure. Um, so the, the request is to approve um, an additional position for our power resources department, which is the, the CCA engine room that, that Richard leads. Um, and um, I, I think there's some information in the staff report. You know, that's a big task and it keeps getting bigger because the state keeps giving us more mandates and you know, we have to do more RFPs to meet those mandates. Um, right now, it's a pretty lean and mean group so, you know, there's Richard as the director of that department and not that other staff don't participate and contribute, but um, you know, the actual the core team is Richard and then um, Gosselin and Sally are the two uh, managers under Richard. Sally really focuses on the account side of things, billing services, working with PG&E and Calpine on, you know, the, the billing data management for 64,000 customers um, that we serve. Um, and Jocelyn really focuses on the power procurement side of things and the contractual portfolio management, working with TEA. Um, and then um, we have a couple specialist positions that are, you know, sort of the those functions, helping with regulatory, you know, filings. Um, and um, we also have a term sort of temporary position 
Um, and so this request is to, to add a, a third specialist to help with sort of the general administrative scheduling meetings, taking meeting minutes. Um, so it would it'd be building that that core permanent team from uh, you know the, the the five that it currently has to adding a, a, a another specialist in that the org chart is on page sixty one there and so it'd be adding that highlighted position um, to to the team and um, as far as the budget um, the this year's staff budget is, is a little bit light because we had some you know filling vacancies delays so it wouldn't actually change this year's budget to add it but it would be adding a permanent position going forward um you know i would say if you look at the the dollars managed to number of staff managing it you know this is probably our a a you know how many millions per person kind of dollars managed you know like i said it's like sally and one one person are managing the account services for you know with the subcontractor for sixty four thousand you know utility accounts and so you know there's there's a lot that goes into that um so i, I think it's a a good investment and you know and in the grand scheme of things we actually have a limited term position filling a lot of the functions that this would basically permanently fill so um when that you know position uh, sunsets, this would ensure that we kind of have that internal admin piece covered. All right, any questions, comments for staff? Yes. I don't either, four months. <laughs> All right, um, very few here like now. So is there anybody from the public? Item 7.1. Raised. Okay. Well, if there's, um, I guess I I need a motion on this one. I guess you convinced us. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the addition of a power resource specialist position and revised organizational chart. Second. Okay. Did you get that, Larry? Okay. Yep. Uh, go ahead. All those in favor, please raise your hands. There is Mobley, Schaefer, Wu, Bauer, Wilson, Provo, Jorgensen, Tuttle, and Arroyo online. Uh, absent is Stefani. Motion passes. And actually, I'm, um, I was remiss at the beginning. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I was remiss at the beginning of this meeting. Um, uh, Director Arroyo, is there anyone 18 years or older in the room with you, or has there been anyone in the room with you during this meeting? <laughs> There has not. Nope. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Hey, next up, staff reports, executive director's report. Something about banking. Yeah. So, so just <laughs> items. One is just to, you know an update that we're continuing to work with the core hub, and that came up as a question. So the you know, Humble Area Foundation has been um, leading this initiative that RCA was sort of one of the kind of founding organizations of. And a big part of that has been engaging on offer wind community benefits. So I just wanted to to make sure you were all aware that you need to be you know active participants in that process with a lot of other groups. And I think now that it's getting to like actually talking to specific developers, you know, there might be again you know the participation in that doesn't necessarily speak for RCEA, you know, in in you know that everything that the Hub agrees to or says in a letter means that every participant is. Um, Signing on to that, but you know, we, we will be listed as a participant in, in those activities. Um, and then, but that's sort of at the staff level. Um, you know, it's really up to, to the, the group, uh, the core hub, you know, HAF decides kind of the, you know, they're, they're managing the process. So it's their process. Um, there have been a number of times where RCA board members have been there in, you know, various capacities, um, you know, either representing the county or different groups. Um, I think it's, I don't think there's an issue with that, you know, in that, um, uh, you know, we'd need to have six board members show up to have a quorum. So it's unlikely that we would ever have a quorum issue, even if, you know, we ended up having the city of Eureka and the city of Arcane the County and the Yurok tribe all there. It's like, we still would be well short of a quorum. So I don't think there's any concern with that um, participation. Um, and then just the other thing I wanted to highlight is, you know, uh, our banking situation, because that's been in the news a lot. Um, uh, you know, the the majority of our banking is with um, Umqua Bank, and um, and just as a side note, um, 
the reason why we, we wanted to pick as local you know, a bank as we could um, because we deal with a lot of cash in and out, um, you know, a lot of our agreements with TEA um, about cash management and you know, risk management, basically that was the, the most local bank that was big enough as far as the volume of deposits to kind of meet the thresholds to risk management. Cause it's like, if you're, you know, they're like, Oh, you've got $70 million coming in and out. If it's a bank that's, you know, too small, that kind of like, there's just risk associated with that sort of seeing that. Um, so the majority of our dollars are Umqua. Um, as far as Wells Fargo, the only relationship we have with Wells Fargo is um, we have a pg e escrow account. So we we had two different escrow accounts with pg e for basically deposits, like security deposits for the CCA, like state required financial security if our program folds. Or and we also had one for the the microgrid construction work that related to PG's piece. That one just closed out, so we just have that CCA financial security. So we have a pretty limited relationship with Wells Fargo, um, and then we do have a um, fairly small account with um, First Republic, which is the one that's been in the news. Um, uh, one of the ones that have been in the news. That is the the USDA loan that we have um, to finance the. Um, Microgrid project are part of the microgrid project. Basically, the USDA requires us to have like a, a deposit control account where we like basically prepay our loan payments to USDA and they can draw them out of that. And so um, finding a bank that could meet all the USDA requirements and check all the boxes was um, a very laborious process. And we ended up, you know, uh, uh, First Republic was the bank that ended up being able to do that. We didn't anticipate that they might find themselves, you know, in this current crisis. I'll say that the amount of money we have with them is is way below, and I don't think it would ever be above the federally insured amount. So, I, you know, I think right now we have sixty five thousand dollars there, something like that. So, I, I don't think we anticipate ever, you know, ever going above the amount. And I think we don't. Staff is not intending to take our money out of that one because we would have to renegotiate everything with the USDA, and that was. Um, Lori Biondini might start throwing stuff at me if we do that. And two, it's like part of the problem is people pulling their money out as the issue. And so like, oh, let's maybe we don't, you know, we don't overreact to the situation and we just leave our, our 65 there. So, um, so you know, it, it came up and like, we don't have any relationship with the Silicon Valley Bank. And, and so um, just wanted to update you on that since it's been very much in the news. Happy to answer any questions on those two items other than that. I have a question. How long do we have to have this pg e escrow account? Basically forever. So hey, like they're never going to trust us to. Yeah, it's, as long as we're operating, it's basically it's the money that if if we all if we evaporated, that would cover the cost of customers returning. It's it's possible that it could eventually be replaced with like a letter of credit or some other. It's, it's been a whole proceeding of like how much is that amount? Is it big enough? And is it you know, uh, how, you know, what's eligible for that? What if you have a credit rating? Should you even have to have that? And so, um, but for the foreseeable future, it's just kind of money that sits there. And I'll say, you know, having somebody that can work through all the pg and requirements, you know, wasn't just like, oh, anybody you want. It was, you know, there was a limited number of banks that, you know, said, oh yeah, we've got the forms that, you know, I know what PG&E wants, we can do it, you know? And so if we were going to change that with Wells Fargo, we'd have to like work with pg e to identify another bank that could meet their requirements. Um, uh, so about how much money is in there? I think it's 142,000. 142, <laughs> okay. Thousand. Yeah, 142,000. <laughs> I got that part. <laughs> okay. Any other questions from us? Or? All right. Take it out to the public. Do they still want the divestment issue? No hands raised online. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Do you want us to bring the divestment question back to discussion or? Um, the one from our public comment yeah. earlier? Um, yes, sure. Because um, I think the request was not to pull money out, but it was a request for them to, for them, Wells Fargo, to um, divest in those fossil fuel investments, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and not that we're just pulling our money out, but we're saying, hey, Wells Fargo, think about what you're doing. Right. Yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you. That'd be great. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on an executive director's reports? Nope. All right. Any future agenda items? Oh, there is one, right, Matthew? Um, we had uh, somebody reach out to me about um, another report that they wanted to give. Oh, yeah. There, there was a, 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 a federal grant that some local um, uh, entities, at least one, were involved in that was about offshore wind public engagement. It's like an app to have people be able to engage. And so I think in May we'll have a, a, a update on that. Will that be in April or May? I think May because oh, okay. Darren wasn't available in April. All righty. Okay. It's not time sensitive, so. Okay. Natalie. Oh, go, go ahead, Natalie. Hi. Um, I had two requests. One is that um, that we do agendize a conversation about a um, default of 100% renewables, just to understand what the implications would be and have more of a board discussion about it. Um, I know that you know our goals are. Anyway, I, I heard the report. <laughs> I know we have a goal uh, that would make it moot, but I'd love to um, discuss it as a near term option, um, regardless. And then um, I also hope to have a discussion and this could happen also just with our attorney, but about, I know all the JPAs locally are, are struggling to kind of figure out where, um, the implications of the um, the the Zoom provisions um, and my current understanding is that actually because we do have a declared county emergency, we may be able to continue um, providing this option with regardless of the just cause provision. So anyway, I just um, th this might be something we could talk about offline and bring back more information about. But either way, I'd like to make sure we don't miss the opportunity to delve into that and bring back info to the board. So I don't know if you need to get input on both of those things and whether folks are interested in um, those topics coming back separately or how you want to handle that, uh, Chair Wu. All right. Thanks, Nelly. Um, probably what we'll do is during agenda review, we can see what's on the agenda, what's coming up. You know, some things are super critical that we got to decide on, others not so much. So, yeah, we'll definitely take them up, though. Does that sound good, folks? Yep. Yes. All right. Um, any public comment on future agenda items? One quick. Oh, go ahead, Dennis. Um, if you are planning on transitioning an at-large position on the CAC to a tribal position, if you had a person in mind, it takes a while to come up to speed, as you all well know. Yeah, I would encourage whoever that person may be is maybe to start attending in the public section. So by the time they get appointed to a seat, they don't spend a whole year trying to figure out the acronyms and the project. So everyone is up to speed on representation and they're engaged. That'd be my only suggestion. It helps a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Anybody else? Okay, well, that's it then. Um, we are now adjourned. Right on time. <laughs> you do it, yeah. You don't have a thousand. Bye, y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Natalie. Casey wouldn't have to use to check it out, but I love it. It's my favorite, favorite part of the meeting at the end. How are you doing?